Good morning, everyone, or rather, good afternoon. I'm Kim T. Ha, and I'm the director of the Pennington Public Library. Thank you so much for joining us today. I am very excited to be hosting Jim Amon today. And not only that, we're going to have people from the Sourland Conservancy as well joining us. When my programming librarian, Tara, and I first saw Jim's book, Seeing the Sourlands, we were so impressed. The gorgeous images, the beautiful passages, and we thought to ourselves, we really want Jim to come speak to our library. So um, here we are, we have him here today. Now, we have a lot of programs coming up in the future, and we would love you to join us for future programs. Please visit Pennington Public Library and our website, PenningtonLibrary.org, to see more of these programs. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce Karina Rand from the Sourland Conservancy, and she will tell us more about Jim and also about the structure of the program today. So let me pass this on to Karina. Karina, are you there? I am, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you so much for joining us, Karina. Can Thank you tell you so us much. more about Jim and also um, about Caroline who will be joining us today? Thank yeah. you. Well, first of all, thank you so much for everyone for joining. Um, it's such a pleasure to be able to share some of these stories of the Sourlands and uh, kind of connect with you guys, even if it is via computer. And thank you, Kim and Tara, so much for organizing this. Um, my gosh, you guys have got this technology Zoom thing nailed, so I appreciate the support from our end. Um, it's been very helpful. So a little bit about myself. Um, as Kim said, I work at Sourland Conservancy. So the Sourland Conservancy is um, the only, uh, excuse me, the only organization completely dedicated to preserving and protecting um, the heritage and culture and ecology of the Sourlands, um, with of course support from all of our lovely organizations that we partner with. The Sourland Mountain is a very special place. Uh, the 90 square mile region is home to the largest continuous forest in central New Jersey. It's a mosaic of forests, wetlands, grassland, habitats, um, which hosts an incredibly rich diversity of animal and plant species, many which are rare and endangered, and many of which you'll see photos and stories that Jim will share later um, this afternoon. Today, the mountain faces many threats, overdevelopment, pollution, deer overpopulation, invasive species, and more. Uh, the current project that we're working on right now is the um, the implications of all the ash trees dying. So we have over a million trees that we're anticipating to lose in the next couple of years. That's in some places from 20% of the forest canopy to 70% of the canopy, which is going to be devastating in so many ways. So we're really working with our members, our volunteers, and our, organ our partner organizations to be able to reforest a lot of the trees and also make sure that we're getting native plants into everyone's garden. So more on that, um, you can learn on our website. But now let me turn it over to why we're all here to talk about Jim Amon and this beautiful book. Um, so Jim, for 29 years, worked as the executive director of the DNR Canal Commission. He was planning for and overseeing the development of the DNR Canal from its condition as an abandoned waterway to today, it's most uh, visited park in the state of New Jersey, which we're all happy is open again. Um, he spent 10 years as the director of stewardship for the DNR Greenway Land Trust, doing ecological restoration work on over 100 nature preserves. Jim has also served as a Sourland Conservancy board member, volunteer, and hike leader for several years. Um, he has enlightened and entertained all of our members and myself as well um, since 2015 with his essay, Seeing the Sourlands. They feature plants, insects, birds, and other natives in the Sourland region. The Conservancy is honored and very grateful for the beneficiary of Jim's talent and deep love of the Sourlands. He has donated all 60 plus of these um, essays and photos so that the Sourland Conservancy can um, benefit from the profits of each sale of the book. 
to continue to do work in stewarding and preserving and protecting the Sourlands. So for now, I'm going to turn it over to Jim. Hello, Karina. I'm not sure. Is my audio on? I can hear you fine, Jim. Okay, good. Um, uh, thank you very much, Karina. I um, am delighted to be here, so thank you also to the Pennington Library. Um, I would like to begin uh, this afternoon's presentation by showing uh, some of the photographs from my book and talking a little bit about them. So if we can begin with, uh, with those, Kim, let's uh, do so. Sure, Jim. I'm going to share my screen right now. Jim, would you mind turning on your camera too? Uh, there, okay. That's wonderful. It's great to see you, Jim. All right, <laughs> let me share my screen. Hopefully everyone can see this. Yes, this uh, map on the uh, left side of the screen shows the extent of the area that's called the Sourlands. Um, there is uh, no clear understanding of how it got that name. Uh, some people believe that there was a German family whose last name was something like Sauer founded uh, a large amount of this property. My feeling is that it comes from the fact that highly acidic soils, which is the case in the Sourlands, are often referred to by farmers as sour land. And so I think that uh, the acidic uh, character of the soil gave uh, this territory its name. Next, next image. This is a uh, photograph that I took on one of the DNR Greenway preserves in the Sourlands. It's, uh, that's the Stony Brook, or one of the many um, uh, tributaries to the Stony Brook that come, uh, that traverse the Sourlands and then join together uh, to form the main stream of, of that creek. And one of the things that I like about this photograph is that the different colors reveal the fact that the forest is vertically uh, stratified. Um, you can see the, uh, the ground layer, you can then see the lower level, the yellow leaves are, are low level, level trees, and gradually um, you, you can then see the canopy so that uh, the structure of the forest is, is very often revealed in the fall. And um, I think this, this photograph does a nice job of that. Those are Christmas ferns in the foreground, slightly to the left, by the way. Um, one of the most common ferns in the Sourlands and, and one of my favorites. They're called Christmas fern um, because they're still green at Christmas time. They're, they're green through most of the, most of the winter. The next image. Well, I guess this is just a picture, a pretty picture. <laughs> I, uh, I'm not sure that there's any lesson here. That, that, that's a, a, uh, a maple leaf in the, in the center, the, uh, and off to the right, the red one. Uh, the, the, they're sugar maple uh, leaves, and obviously they've fallen into the Stony Brook, and uh, water is beating up on them. Uh, so this was just a picture that I happened to uh, really, really like a lot. Next image. The um, yellow in this picture is all goldenrod, and goldenrod is one of the most common meadow plants that we have in our area. Um, the uh, trees are all red cedars, which is the only evergreen tree that is native to this region. Um, the goldenrod is a very interesting plant. It, um, it is edible. Uh, I tried eating it and found that it was pretty bitter and, and unpleasant in the late summer. 
And I was told, I read then that it's early summer, or early summer when the new leaves are emerging that um, it's, it's most tasty. Another interesting thing about goldenrod is that a percentage of its sap is latex. And um, the, uh, there was some effort by Thomas Edison to make rubber out of goldenrod sap. It was an effort that didn't succeed. But Edison's good friend, uh, Henry Ford, who evidently had a sense of humor that not many people knew about, uh, gave Edison a Model T Ford with goldenrod latex tires on it. I'm not sure how that worked out, but I thought it was an interesting little anecdote to know about goldenrod. Next image. Uh, this is a tree with many, many different names. Um, it, it, its most frequently used common name is ironwood, and it has that name because you can see that its uh, limbs look um, look really hard. They look like uh, they, they look like metal. They also look a little bit like a well-muscled arm or leg, and that in fact leads to another name, common name that it has, which is uh, muscle wood. Uh, some people see its leaves looking a lot like be beech tree leaves, and the fact that its bark isn't uh, isn't either uh, striated or 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 checkered, and they think of it as a beech, and so they call it a blue beech. Uh, it's also known as an American hornbeam, and um, so it depends sort of on what region you're from, what name you use uh, to to apply to this plant. And it, I think that's a good explanation for why the botanical names, which are so often difficult for anybody to know, it, are, are quite useful because if you call this American hornbeam, people might get confused with the hop hornbeam. If you call it a blue beech, people might get confused with the beech tree. But if you call it uh, uh, Carpinus caroliniana, no one can get confused about it. Thank you. Let's go on to the next image. One of the wonderful things about the Sauerlands forest is how wonderfully diverse it is in, in different kinds of plants. Uh, once again, in the foreground and right in front of us is a Christmas fern, and just a little bit to the right and behind it is a skunk cabbage. And there's skunk cabbage on the other bank of the, of the stream. There's some spice bush in this. There is uh, may apples. Um, there are all kinds of different uh, canopy level trees. And um, this, this rich, rich um, combination of plants is uh, one of the things that makes the Sauerland so absolutely um, enticing. And of course, the boulders are also um, another aspect of this, um, this, this image and, and of the Sauerlands. Uh, the Sauerlands is so full of these boulders, and many people think that they are glacially brought, but they aren't. They were, um, they're, they're volcanic uh, lava that hardened into rock uh, 250 million years ago. And uh, some of it has uh, emerged, some of it has, has come up because it has been eroded around. Um, but uh, these boulders are all uh, boulders that are in place here, not brought here by the glacier. The glacier didn't in fact get to the Sauerlands. Next image. Uh, this is uh, a a scene that you can see right now in the Sauerlands forest. It's uh, may apples. Uh, and uh, one of the things that everybody always complains about is how um, alien species in some cases propagate so profusely that they don't leave room for anything else to come in, therefore by uh, diluting the diversity of the forest. And may apples do have a little bit of this problem. Um, you can see some, um, some shrubs sticking up through them. That's a maple leaf viburnum shrub on the left-hand side, um, and a spice bush, I think, on the right-hand side. But um, 
the maples also um, only uh, look this much like a carpet uh, in the in the early spring. Um, incidentally, these are all one plant. They're all connected underground. And another interesting thing about may apples is that nobody knows how old they are. It's believed that they are well over 100 years old, but nobody has a way of determining how old uh, may apples uh, can live, can be. Next image. One of the things that always catches my eye as a photographer is when I see a pattern that is uh, almost abstract or is abstract, but is nevertheless identifiable. And that's what I like about this image of birch bark. Um, this is a, a birch tree that uh, the bark is peeling away, revealing uh, layer after layer. Um, and the um, the pattern is, is completely abstract, but yet there is uh, an ability to identify it as, as birch bark. Um, and that's something that I always enjoy uh, photographing. So next, next image. Well, this is just hands down my favorite photograph. <laughs> That's why it's on the cover of my book. It's, it's bloodroot. And this is a, a flowering plant that comes up first thing in the spring. Um, bloodroot is up and in flower long before any of the other spring woodland flowers are, are in flower. And um, it's interesting, it is um, pollinated uh, by insects and ants. And the ants, in fact, when the uh, when the flower dies and the seeds develop, the ants take the seeds to their nests where they eat the fruit that's around the seed and then they put the seed in their garbage dump. Um, ant colonies have areas where they put things that are, that are garbage to them. And the seeds, therefore, are very often planted by ants. Next image. When I was first learning about uh, the plants in the natural world, I took a series of classes at Bowman's Hill Wildflower Preserve. And um, one day the subject of the class was ferns. And the teacher came into the room and the first thing that she said was, just about the prettiest thing you will ever see in a forest is a maidenhair fern. And, um, I have to agree, and I think that this photograph uh, shows why I agree. Um, it's always interested me that um, uh, ferns do not seem to provide food for any of the native wildlife. Uh, most na native plants, uh, by midsummer, every leaf on a, on a native plant has been eaten or has a hole in it or has uh, the edges uh, sculpted by some plant, some native uh, animal or other. And um, the ferns seldom do, but the ferns do provide an ecological importance to the uh, landscape. They provide shelter for uh, frogs and, and, and small animals. Um, they, they, uh, the roots hold the soil from erosion and the plants shade the soil, therefore retaining moisture in the soil for longer periods and all of the other plants benefit from moist soil. Next image. This is a, a boulder in the Sourlands covered with several different kinds of lichen. And, um, Lichen is a very interesting, um, it isn't really even a plant. It's a combination of an algae, algae and, um, algae and, uh, 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 anyhow, it's, it's, it's a combination of several things. The, um, the algae does the photosynthesis and brings uh, nutrients to it. And it is, of, I think, another example of a plant that makes an abstract yet recognizable pattern. Uh, next image. Uh, 
the first time I saw one of these guys, I thought, wow, that's a pretty nasty looking bee. You'd better stay away from it. Um, it hovers like a bee. It um, sips ne nectar like a bee. It also uh, bears some resemblance to hummingbirds, and that's why it is called a hummingbird moth. Uh, you can see the antenna on it are in fact characteristic of moth antenna. Um, and it is a, um, one, of, one of the plants, you, the, the long black uh, line that's coming out of its nose and going into the flower is how it, is, how it sups the nectar from the flower. And it is um, one of the many things to, that we can find in the Sourlands that just adds such, such mystery and such delight to, um, to a visit there. Next image. Well, this is uh, one of the most beautiful butterflies that we have in our region. Uh, this is an American Beauty butterfly. Um, and um, it is um, nectaring and evidently became so um, engaged in its uh, pursuit of nectar that it allowed me to uh, creep up fairly close to it. Uh, it turns out that um, butterflies have very complex eyes that allow it to see almost in 360 degrees. There's a little area straight in front of it that is a dark spot for them. But while they can see all of that, their, their ability to see things in detail is really not good at all. So if you want to um, get close to a butterfly, the thing to do is to move very close, very carefully, very slowly, and they will allow you, in some cases, to, to get close. Uh, incidentally, one way of telling the difference between a butterfly and a moth is that the uh, butterflies have little clubs on the end of their antenna. You can see them here. Uh, and moths uh, more, more often have fan-like antennas, as we saw in the hummingbird moth. Next image. Uh, skunk cabbage is uh, an early spring plant. It uh, comes up greener than green after we've all been so hungry to see some green all winter long. And um, it is a, a very interesting plant. Uh, it's uh, seldom eaten by anything. Every now and then you might find an insect hole in it, uh, but uh, it, it has an awful aroma if you get close to it, especially if you crush one of the leaves. Um, it smells a little like a skunk. And um, it is a, a, uh, unpalatable because it has toxins in it. Um, it also has the bad habit of by midsummer, instead of turning into a blaze of yellows or oranges like the other plants do in the fall, it turns a sort of a slimy looking brown and falls to the forest floor. Uh, even after it does that, however, it uh, becomes habitat for many small forest uh, insects. So even at its worst, it is, uh, it's a plant that is making a contribution to the ecology of the Sourlands. Next image. There are many different woodpeckers in uh, the Sourlands. There are five different species of woodpecker. This is a female downy. The male downies have a little red spot on the back of their head. And um, one of the things that I really like about this photograph is the way the woodpecker and the, and the tree trunk, um, it's hard to tell one from the other. And uh, since woodpeckers spend a lot of time on tree trunks, uh, this is their camouflage. This is their way of protecting themselves from becoming uh, lunch for a cooper's hawk or a sharp shinned hawk. And um, the woodpeckers have the, um, have, have the gift of, of enlivening a forest, not only with their presence in their song, but also with their wrapping away I've often wondered why they don't uh, bl knock their brains out when they do it, but uh, they have a different anatomy from the human brain. First of all, the brain is very tightly confined within the uh, skull. 
Um, further, there is a, a membrane that goes from underneath their chin around their heads and, and protects the, um, the brain, holds it, holds it very still. It's also uh, believed that woodpeckers uh, never hit uh, their object with their beak exactly the same way twice in a row. So they are um, hitting different areas at slightly different angles and that prevents them from getting a repetition of the same kind of blow to their head. Um, next image. Well, if you like large birds that don't move around fast and up in the canopy of trees, then great blue herons are your kind of bird. Uh, they're certainly my kind of bird. They're so beautiful um, and so interesting. Uh, we have um, a number of uh, great blue herons in along waterways. Their principal uh, their principal uh, food is, is uh, aquatic animals and fish, uh, fish and frogs and uh, uh, other things that might be found in a stream. And they are, um, they are very, very easy for us to see when they're, when they're hunting because they stand very, very still and they're very large. So <laughs> they, they, they really are, um, a good bird for beginning bird bird watching. Next image. One of the themes of my book is um, that if you, you look closely at things that are common, you can see how beautiful they are. I mean, how many people, how many bird watchers even realize that morning doves have a blue circle around their eye? Um, and look at those lovely little feet, you know, so beautiful. And the, and the, the entire body looks to me like it was designed um, in the 1930s by an Art Deco uh, person. Uh, morning doves have, um, have the also gift of, uh, of making a sound, which sounds a little like somebody who is in mourning. Uh, but it is such a soft, gentle sound that it's hard for me to hear one and not think, Oh, I hear you, dear. I hear you, and um, I think um, that we we need to look more closely at morning doves and at robins and at blue jays and at all the things that we think are so common that they don't merit a close look, because they do. Next image. Uh, I, this is another picture that I put in just because I like it so much. This frog looks like he's uh, just checking me out or checking out my camera. What on earth is uh, that guy doing with that thing pointing at me and should I uh, be worried about it? Uh, but uh, anyhow, he wasn't too worried. Uh, he, he hung around long enough for me to get this picture. Um, Frogs and toads are fairly common in the Sourlands, and it turns out that frogs and toads uh, do not have taxonomic differences. Um, you might think of frogs as having um, slimy, smooth skin, and toads as having warty, dry skin, and that's generally true, but there are examples that are not, uh, not that way in both frogs and in toads. And frogs uh, breathe through their skin. So if you see a frog, you can be confident that the water that the frog is in is not polluted, or at least not too badly polluted. Um, that, that makes them what we refer to as an indicator species. Uh, they are indicating uh, that the water is free of pollutants. Next image. Uh, we all love cottontail rabbits. I mean, who doesn't just feel thrilled when you see one of these lovely little animals? Um, cottontails, as you can see by this image, have a wonderful ability to be camouflaged. Their, their uh, fur looks very much uh, like, like their habitat. Uh, when they are Decide, when they do decide to uh, run away from a potential predator, they run in zigzag patterns um, that sometimes work and sometimes the pursuer is as agile as they are and it doesn't work. Um, in fact, um, frogs or <laughs> rabbits 
have a very high mortality rate. Um, everybody eats them. Uh, coyotes eat them, foxes eat them, uh, hawks eat them. Every, every, everybody likes to eat uh, rabbits and rabbits um, are vegetarians. <laughs> they don't eat anything but grass. Um, their, their main survival tactic, in addition to being uh, camouflaged and, and running in zigzag patterns, is that they reproduce like, um, well, like rabbits. And um, so the individual might not have a long life, but the species has, in fact, been around for um, uh, hundreds of thousands of years. And that's uh, where we're going to stop now for a, a discussion with uh, Caroline Kotman, uh, the uh, former director of the uh, Sauerlands Conservancy. Hi, Jim. Thank you so much for your insight onto your photos. They're so beautiful, but to see and hear your thoughts behind them is wonderful. I am going to transfer this over to Karina right now so Karina can introduce Caroline. Karina, are you there? Yes, I see you. Thank you, Jim. It's, it's so, I've seen these photos a million times working with you on this project, but again, as Kim said, just hearing your feedback on it is just, it's really marvelous, so thank you. Um, so we're gonna shift gears a little bit right now and we're gonna have Caroline Katman, who, as Jim said, was the Sourland Conservancy Executive Director from 2013 until recently uh, when she retired last year in 2019. And Caroline was absolutely instrumental in kind of pulling this project together and really, um, just having such an incredible eye for design and detail to be able to have this book published. So thank you, Caroline. Um, so Caroline's gonna ask Jim some questions and we'll learn a little bit more about kind of his process, um, how he got into photography. And I also wanna invite anyone that has any questions for Jim um, to feel free to put it in the chat. Um, we'll have some time at the end to be able to answer some of those questions. Um, and then followed by the um, conversation with Caroline and Jim, Jim will read two of his essays. So off to you, Caroline and uh, Jim. Hi, can you hear me, Jim? Yes, I can. Okay, great, nice to see you. It looks like you've got a nice sunny place to sit. Yeah, it wasn't sunny a few minutes ago, but then I have a skylight and apparently things are changing as I sit here. So hopefully you can see me. Absolutely. It's more important that we see you. <laughs> so Jim, I've spoken to so many people about the first time they they came to the Sourlands, whether it was to move here or to ride their bikes through the region or just take a drive down the back roads here. And most of them say that when they first came here, they thought it was just a pretty place. And then as they spent more time in the region, they learned more about it and uh, started to appreciate how unique it is and how important it is to protect it. So I'm, I'm wondering, I'm hoping that you can tell us about why you first came to the Sourlands, when you first came here, uh, was your impression that it was just a pretty place? And how did you get to the point where you appreciated it so much that it inspired the kind of creativity that we see in your book? Well, I first came to this area, I moved to Hopewell Borough um, almost 50 years ago. And I did so because I had a job in New York City and there was a train that stopped in Hopewell Borough and took me into Newark where I transferred to another train and, and got to work. Um, after doing that for um, four or five years, I, um, I left that job. I was an editor of scholarly books for the Oxford University Press's New York office. Um, and took a job with the um, New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. And at first I was a special assistant to the commissioner and did a lot of odd jobs. And then I took a job as the director of a newly formed agency called the Delaware and Raritan Canal Commission. And the canal had just been named by the state as a state park. And the commission was created to 
plan for its development and to oversee that development. And one of the things that um, I quickly realized is that the canal park um, really depends very much on the context through which it flows. The canal park is often only about 100 feet wide. So what's around it is really important. And so I began looking around it and I saw all these streams that came down into the canal um, along the, the Delaware and then, along, uh, then through Princeton and, and through Grigstown, Rocky Hill. Um, and I got very interested in that as the context and began realizing how really wonderful uh, all the streams that came out of the Sourlands and came down into the Canal Park were. Uh, it wasn't very long after that that um, uh, the DNR Greenway started preserving land in the Sourlands. And, um, and then when I became an employee of the Greenway, it was my job to take care of the properties they owned. So I, um, I began really at that point uh, seriously investigating what was, what was on those preserves that the DNR Greenway owned and how do they grow and what kind of care did they need. But uh, from there then I, I uh, joined the uh, Sourlands Conservancy Board and decided that it would be a nice idea to uh, to entice people to appreciate the Sourlands by showing them uh, lovely photographs and and texts that could um, explain what what was there and how it worked. And everyone should know that you're still writing the essays and taking photographs and uh, the Conservancy is actually uh, still publishing them monthly in their e-newsletters. So they're still coming, right? <laughs> yes, yes. I, in fact, I've uh, done a little, about a dozen uh, topics uh, since the book was published. And anybody who wants to can uh, be put on the mailing list by uh, contacting the Sourlands Conservancy and signing up. I mean, it would be very nice if you also gave them some money, but you don't have to, to, to receive the, uh, the emails. <laughs> good plug, Jim, good plug. <laughs> so Jim, I've seen many of your non-Sourland photos and you know, I, I love them all. Many of your other photos are, are landscapes and not close-up shots like the ones in the book, some of which are even uh, portrait-like, especially the ones on the inside covers. And I'm wondering what makes you decide, when do you decide to zoom in on a subject? Um, and as you walk around with your camera, how do you decide what to, what to photograph and how to photograph it? Um, well, a, a number of years ago, oh, about um, oh, five years ago, I guess, about the time I started writing these essays, um, I decided that the uh, native flowering plants were so beautiful that, and so little appreciated, um, I mean, not very many people uh, put the native plants into their home gardens. And I thought that they were worthy of, of closer looks. And so I wanted to do a series of photographs of uh, formal portraits of uh, native flowering plants. And um, I walked around the Sourlands with a black t-shirt and a camera on a tripod. <laughs> <laughs> and would hang the t-shirt behind uh, the subject of my uh, photograph and take uh, portraits that I thought were reminiscent of studio portraits of uh, famous people. And um, it was a series that I thoroughly enjoyed doing and it was also a series that uh, I think uh, achieved its purpose uh, as the, the pictures in the book uh, show these are not these are not just weeds. These are not just something that happens uh, to grow on the side of the road. These are in fact beautiful, beautiful pictures. Uh, in terms of deciding what to photograph, that's uh, a little tricky because, like any photographer, um, I take um, 
probably 25 pictures for every one that I show anybody. <laughs> and so that's, uh, that's the way almost any photographer works. Uh, years ago, I remember reading about uh, National Geographic photographers and how they would take uh, several hundred uh, rolls of film in order to produce a photo essay in the magazine that might have eight photographs in it. And um, that's, I think, an easy thing to, um, to, to make your conscience feel a little better about taking a lot of photographs that you delete when you get them home and put them on your screen. Um, in general, though, what I do is that I walk around looking for something that strikes my interest. Um, I was out earlier this morning, for instance, and one of the things I noticed was that a number of plants, uh, the new leaves on a number of plants are, are reddish in color. And so I photographed uh, some poison ivy leaves and some uh, uh, shagbark hickory leaves and uh, some sassafras leaves. And I, I just photographed as many of the leaves that had a reddish tint to them as I could find. Hmm. And I think that's the key is that what uh, any photographer needs to do is to just look for what interests you and then look for what's the best angle and and you really have to look through your viewfinder or at your at your led screen and see everything look from corner to corner and make sure that you're photographing what you want to photograph and not uh, some extraneous stuff that you can move around and get out of the picture and also always walk around with an old t-shirt <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Good tips. So um, can you tell us a little bit about your writing process? Um, I'm always curious about, you know, what comes first, the photo or the topic and the words? Um, if the photo comes first, uh, the, do you then research before you start writing? Just can you tell us a little bit about your writing process? Well, I'm afraid it isn't uh, very straightforward um, because uh, sometimes I'll have a photograph that I really like and think, oh, I can write an essay on the subject of that photograph. And sometimes it will be just the opposite. I will have a subject that interests me and I will do some research on it and then go out and look for taking pictures of it. I mean, right now, for instance, I am, I have written a, a, an essay on uh, grackles. And um, until two days ago, uh, my camera was broken and I finally got the new lens that uh, I ordered. And so I'm back in business. And so maybe this afternoon I'll go out and see if I can find some grackles to photograph. <laughs> uh, what I, what I do is, since I'm not a trained uh, scientist, is that I, I use uh, the internet and I put subjects in, I put questions in. Uh, the key, I think, more than anything else is to be sure that um, you don't ignore any questions that are in your own mind. You know, if, if you see something, as I mentioned earlier, the reddish hue of, uh, of new leaves. Well, why are some trees have reddish hue? Well, it turns out I, I came home and researched it <laughs> and uh, found out that uh, different plants have different amounts of, uh, of, of the uh, chemical that produces the chlorophyll in them as, as they emerge. And so without a lot of chlorophyll, there's nothing to turn the leaf green. But after the leaf has been out a while, the sunlight and, and, uh, and air uh, cause the chlorophyll to, to appear and that causes the green to come. And it causes this, this shiny pale green that we see and love so much in the spring to get deeper and deeper in, in green through the summer. Hmm. So it seems like it's just your, your natural curiosity about things that uh, points you in the direction you want to go. Yes, you know, it, it's, it's one of the advantages of being retired is that if you see something, you say, what's that or how does that work? You can come home and find out. <laughs> you, know, you don't have uh, 
you don't have to get off to work and, and then, you know, get home from work and have too many other things on your plate. Uh, so I've, I've uh, really enjoyed my, my retirement and it allows me to, uh, to pursue whatever happens to seem curious to me. That's awesome. I'm getting a little taste of that myself these days. So, um, so one of the things that surprised me when I saw some of your other photos is that many of them are um, urban photos or the subjects are urban. Do you, and um, I saw that at a, a gallery show you had in Lambertville. Do you have any shows coming up? Oh, you know, the coronavirus has- Oh, that's true, yeah. everything down, <laughs> so- I <laughs> get that. <laughs> Yeah, this is probably going to be a year without any photography shows for me. <laughs> uh, what were the best uh, places in your mind that you've exhibited your photos? Um, gosh, let's see. I um, One of the nicest places was the um, East Amwell Historical Society's Historic House. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, it, it, it's in Ringo's and it's a really beautiful old house that has been wonderfully restored. And I thought my pictures looked just terrific in that house. Um, another venue that I, um, I liked a lot was um, the, um, I can't think of the name of it now, but there is a rehabilitation center in Plainsboro associated with Princeton Hospital. And um, my wife, who does uh, uh, collage art, and I had a joint exhibit there. And the curator wanted to call it uh, a marriage of styles. And we both thought, gee, our styles are so different. This maybe ought to be called a, a divorce of styles. But uh, <laughs> the curator had the ability of putting our work on the walls in a way that made us see it anew and see that there was something uh, that was similar to um, her work and mine. And so we both really enjoyed that one a lot. Oh, I bet. That's great. That's great. So I have one more question. You once shared with me one of your pet peeves. You said that um, sometimes when people look at your photographs, they're obviously admiring them. And um, the first thing they say to you is they'll turn to you and they'll say, wow, what kind of camera did you use? <laughs> yes. why, is that, why does that irk you? <laughs> well, uh, because it's um, attributing the art to the machine instead of to the artist. Um, but what I would like to say is that there are so many good cameras out there and so many cheap good cameras out there. I mean, I, I have an expensive camera and I think it's better than the cheap cameras that I have. But anybody who is interested in photography can spend a couple hundred dollars and get a really good camera. And, and there's no reason to be hesitant to uh, do so. And I lied, I actually have one more question. Okay. If, you're, if your photos and your essays inspire folks about the Sarolins, what, what advice would you give them? What would you tell them? How should they go out and discover the Sarolins for themselves? Well, uh, I think they should just go with an open mind and an active curiosity. And, um, and remember that it isn't, when you're walking in the Sourlands, it isn't like you're on the way to the dentist where there is an appointment that you must make or you're on your way to work and you have to get there before nine o'clock. If you see something when you're walking in the Sourlands that strikes your interest, walk over to it. Stop, look at it, walk around it. Um, try and see it for all that it is. and. Um, and if you take a picture of it and come home, you can use the picture to uh, find out what it is if you, uh, if you didn't know. Thanks so much, Jim. It's great to see you and talk with you as usual. Well, thank you. And I would like to thank you again, as I've thanked you many times for all you did to make this book so wonderful. You were just essential to uh, its, its publication as such a beautiful book. Thank you, it was my complete pleasure.
Good. <laughs> All right, what I'd like to do now is to um, read a couple of short essays from the book. And, um, and then afterwards we can have questions if, uh, if anybody has some. Um, my first essay is uh, on white oak trees. And there it is. There is the white oak, by the way. Um, and the essay goes, a gigantic white oak stands on the bank of the Stony Brook in the Hopewell Township Nature Preserve called Cedar Ridge. I've measured this tree to try to determine its age and concluded that it is about 300 years old. Middle age for a species that lives to be 500 years old. If that is right, this tree started its life at about the same time that J.S. Bach was composing his sublime music. His first sonata was performed in 1704. In the New World, 20 people, most of them women, were executed for committing witchcraft and in Salem, Massachusetts at about the time that this tree started growing. The French philosopher of the Enlightenment, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, was born at about the same time as this tree. This white oak reached the age of 100 years as George Washington was ending his second term as president. Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart's great opera, Don Giovanni, had been performed for the first time and Beethoven, a young man of 30 in 1800, was captivating musical audiences. Napoleon Bonaparte became Emperor of France in 1804. When the tree was 200 years old, the last of the great flocks of passenger pigeons flew overhead. Automobiles were beginning to be seen on streets in America. The French Impressionists had just completed their revolution in painting. Thomas Edison, working in Menlo Park, New Jersey, had gotten a patent for the electric light. The great ocean liner Titanic sank in the North Atlantic in 1911. On July 21st, 1969, before the tree could reach its 300th year, Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. What a lifespan. For 300 years, this white oak has been part of the Sauerland's ecosystem. Its acorns have fed generation after generation of deer, raccoon, turkey, mice, black bears, squirrels, and blue jays. Its cavities have provided a safe nest for chickadees, wrens, and many other species of birds. Oaks are the quintessential supporter of caterpillars and moths. At least 105 species of moths and butterflies feed off parts of oak trees. This in turn has attracted many species of birds that feed on the caterpillars. It is well known in birding circles that if you want to see a warbler in the spring, you should look for an oak in flower. This white oak does not stand straight. Instead, it leans away from the Stony Brook, reminiscent of the posture of Balzac in the great Rodin sculpture. Like that sculpture, it gives the impression that it is surveying in a lordly way all that is before it. The Druids believed that old oaks could whisper prophecies to them. You will have to decide that for yourself, but I don't think this tree is talking, either about the history it has surveyed or the future before us. Even in silence, though, it is a rewarding destination. I seek its presence several times a year to sit under, walk around, and of course, to touch. White oaks are wonderful trees to plant in a big yard. There is only one problem. If you plant a white oak today in 450 years, somebody's heart will break because it will die. So I'd like to move from the majestic to the tiny. And the tiny in this case is um, uh, the, I'm sorry, I lost my place, water striders. Water striders are those little critters that you see on bodies of water that just skitter around on, on the surface. 
There are many web pages with titles like interesting facts about blank, fill in the blank. I went to an interesting facts about water striders page and found that I was not being misled. There are a lot of really interesting, even fascinating facts about these little bugs. The most obvious is that they live on the surface of the water and stride across the surface without sinking or even getting wet. How do they do that? Three factors contribute to this unique ability. The most important one is related to the nature of water. Yes, there's the water strider on your screen now. Uh, water molecules stick to each other. The way water beads on leaves after a rain or drips from a faucet in a compact form are examples of water molecules cohering. The water molecules on the surface of bodies of water are a little more cohesive than those without contact with air, forming an invisible thin skin on the surface. Another reason for water striders' remarkable feat of staying on the surface is that they are very light and they have three pairs of legs that distribute that little bit of weight to six areas. Further, water striders' bodies, including their legs, are very densely covered with tiny hairs, more than a thousand hairs per square millimeter of body. The, the hairs trap the air and that adds to the buoyancy of this bug. But how do they move? If you stand on the edge of a pond or stream and watch water striders move about, it looks like they simply flex their legs and off they go. But how does that work? Their movement is almost entirely generated by the middle pair of legs. The rear pair is used for steering. The front pair is used to capture prey. The middle pair of legs pushes against the edge of the little dimples that are created by the contact between the leg and the water surface. That seemed to me to be a weak way to be propelled, but it turns out to be highly effective. Water striders can move at speeds of up to 100 times their body length per second. A six foot tall human would have to swim at over 400 miles per hour to equal that rate. Water striders can also jump. They use all six legs for this and they employ jumps to get beyond obstacles in the water or even to jump over each other. I don't think that I have ever seen a water strider fly, but when I looked into this issue, I got a curious answer. First, several scientists report on situations where a new freshwater body of water is formed and almost immediately, how it hosts water striders. One of the scientists said that it is like water striders are always flying above our heads, unseen. But not all water striders have wings. Some species of water striders do not ever have wings. But for other species, broods may or may not have wings, depending on where they live. If they live in a wetland that is susceptible to drying up, those water striders will have broods that have wings. But if the habitat is a stable pond or stream, water striders will have wingless broods. It can change from brood to brood depending on habitat. The length of the wing is also subject to change. Water striders that live in turbulent water have broods with short wings. Long wings can be damaged in turbulent water. Water striders form calm but in constant, but in constant water will have broods with long wings. Water striders mostly eat insects that have fallen into the water or the larva of mosquitoes or other insects that lay their eggs in water. This made me wonder just how many insects fall into water, but it turns out that it is pretty common. If however not many fallen insects are available, the water striders simply eat each other. They capture their prey with the front pair of legs and use sharp mouth parts to penetrate the prey's outer surface. Then they inject enzymes that turn the insect's innards to a liquid, which they drink. This is similar to how spiders eat the insects that they catch in webs. 
but water striders are not related to spiders. Both spiders and water striders have too small of a throat to pass solids. Water striders do not bite humans. It is easy to imagine if they were big enough, they would gladly do so. So those are two of the 64 essays that are in uh, Seeing with Sauerlands, a book that you can purchase uh, by going to the Sauerland Conservancy webpage. And I hope you do. Um, at this point, I'd be happy to ask, answer any questions that anybody might have. Hi, Jim. Thank you so much. That was really beautiful. We do have some questions from our attendees. Um, Tara wants to know where are a few of your favorite places to go for walks in the Sauerlands? Uh, I'm not sure I should tell you. I like the solitude. <laughs> <laughs> it's always the trouble, right? <laughs> no, I, I'd be happy to tell you because uh, the, the more people who enjoy them, the better it is as far as I'm concerned. Uh, one of my favorites is this preserve called Cedar Ridge. There's a parking lot on Van Dyke Road just off of Route 518. Um, and um, Cedar Ridge is um, a wonderful preserve. The Stony Brook is there. Uh, it has meadows, it has hedgerows, it has immature forest, it has uh, mature forest, so it has a little bit of everything. Um, also, if you uh, go up to uh, Mountain Road in East Amwell Township, uh, just a little down from Wurtsville Road um, is a parking lot for a preserve called um, the Sauerlands Ecosystem. And uh, Sauerlands Ecosystem Preserve is about 700 contiguous acres of preserved land. And it has a lot of paths leading in lots of different directions and you can't lose no matter which one you take. They're all wonderful. Oh, thank you for sharing. I know it was hard for you. <laughs> <laughs> Judith wants to know uh, what the purple flower is in that photo where you have the hummingbird moth. Uh, let me check. <laughs> I think it was uh, Monarda, the uh, bee balm, but um, oh, it isn't in the book. Um, yes, I, I'm pretty sure it's, it's uh, bee balm. Okay. Karina wants to remind everyone that um, the book can be purchased directly online and she provided a link, direct link to the book. Any other questions? I think Caroline may have asked a lot of questions that everyone wanted to ask. Well, let me just Thank you, Kim and Tara, for uh, hosting this presentation. It was a great pleasure for me to do so. Yes, thank you. And it's so great to, you know, we've never met in person, but I've been meeting so many people in the community via Zoom recently. So it's been a pleasure to meet you after seeing all your photographs and reading through your book. Um, thank you. Yes, thank you. We have a lot of comments from people who are saying that it was really interesting and thank you. Uh, we have someone who said that she interviewed you years ago for the New York Times, and she wanted to congratulate you on the book. Nancy Kennedy, I believe. And Laurie Cleveland from the Sauerland Conservancy wants to thank everyone. So thank you so much, Jim, for joining us in the middle of the day, this beautiful day. And also, I wanted to remind everyone that the library does have a lot of programs coming up. This Sunday, we have Doug Dixon. Um, coming and he's going to talk about digital history. He's working on a project um, to digitize history for Hopewell and the surrounding regions. And then we have a TED Talk conversation coming up on Monday where we are going to have a virtual visit to the Sistine Chapel and hear another side about the Sistine Chapel. So if you are interested, please feel free to go to PenningtonLibrary.org and to register. I also have a link, which I will provide right now, to a survey. If you have any comments, um, any questions, please feel free to fill out this survey, give Jim some feedback, and also to provide us with any thoughts about any future programs you would like to see come to the library. 
And I think that is it, Tara. Was there anything else that you wanted to remind me? My right hand woman, Tara, the other librarian. All right, so a lot of people enjoyed it. And I will be in touch, Jim. We do have this recorded. So this is new to the library too. So we will figure out how to have it accessible for people who um, missed it or are interested in seeing the photos again. Thank you so much, Karina and Caroline and Jim, the Sarland Conservancy, and also um, my cohorts at the library. And thank you to all of you for joining us today. We'll see you soon via Zoom. Thank you. <laughs>